if you believe as we do that every child, every person has a spark of divinity in them and is therefore worthy of respect, what we saw in those rooms was dazzling, sparkling array of God's children worthy of respect. So we have to use, as was said this morning, the, the crisis that some view as a crisis, and it does have crisis uh, at, uh, qualities, as an opportunity to show who we are as Americans, that we do respect people for their dignity and worth. from the congregation. Bobby's very angry. Well, hello, fellow Catholics out there in Internet land. Uh, my name is Efren Cortez, and once again, you're tuned in to Cafeteria Catholics, the show for Cafeteria Catholics, not by Cafeteria Catholics, and we are coming to you from Lexington, Kentucky, via Spreaker. And I Heart Radio, the state of the art in internet communications. And what's going on, fellow Catholics? Great to be behind the Cafeteria Catholics microphone once again. And in the company of fellow Catholics, as you know, I am your humble host, Efren Cortez, and you are tuned in to Cafeteria Catholics. And we are all over the internet, fellow Catholics. We are on YouTube, Facebook. Twitter, SoundCloud, Tumblr, Stumble, all over the place, fellow Catholics, all over the place. There is no reason why you should not build a social media relationship with cafeteria Catholics, because it's easy to do. We've made it easy for you to do that, fellow Catholics, okay? You can even drop us a line. Cafeteria Catholics, Yahoo.com is the way in which you can do that, fellow Catholics. Let us know whether you like the show, whether you hate the show, whether you love the show. Okay, if you make any kind of an effort on the Internet to find us, you will. You will. So, don't hesitate, fellow Catholics. Let us know how you feel about a cafeteria, or even if you've got a question. Okay, whatever the case might be, let us know. Okay? Build a social media relationship with cafeteria Catholics. Help us to take the teaching of the Catholic Church out into the streets by spreading the word. Okay? We are on the net waves, fellow Catholics. We are on the net waves. Cafeteria Catholics. Let your friends know. Let your friends know, family members, all that good stuff, fellow Catholics. But anyway, last time on the show, we spoke a little bit we had the audacity, fellow Catholics, to try and explain the unexplainable, the Holy Trinity, right? We delved into, we dared to delve into the Holy Trinity and tried to give you some sort of logical and rational explanation or outlook as to how to view the Holy Trinity. We tried to open a door for you, okay? Uh, because it is a mystery, so we, we tried to pull the veil back just a little bit, okay? So that you could, you know, take it upon yourself to delve even deeper into this awesome mystery that is the Holy Trinity, fellow Catholics. But who could ever truly explain the Holy Trinity? But we, we tried. We tried, right? And we spoke about the second person of the Holy Trinity, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, right? And how he is referred to as the Word in the Scriptures. And as a matter of fact, John, and there's a point to this, fellow Catholics, okay? I don't want to, you know, complicate your life even further, okay, by delving into this once again, okay? But there is a point to this, and uh, let me put it this way, okay? This is the aim, this is the goal that we are trying to reach with this uh, opening conversation here, okay? What is 
the oldest religion on the face of the planet. This is the goal that we are trying to reach with this conversation here, fellow Catholics, okay? What is the oldest religion on the face of the planet? Is it Hinduism? Okay? Is it uh, Kabbalah, whatever it is that Madonna's into over there? Is it Judaism? You know, I, a guy told me the other day, okay, that the oldest religion, and this is what kind of sparked the thought process with me, okay, uh, but this guy, friend of mine, okay, a, a, a longtime friend of mine, uh, told me that the oldest religion is Santeria, okay? Santeria is basically witchcraft. It's what it is. It is a Spanish uh, version of, of I'm not going to call it Catholicism because it's not, but it, it, it is a, a melding together of Catholicism and witchcraft, right? And he says that this is the oldest religion, okay? But anyway, uh, that's beside the point, right? I'll deal with, with my uh, longtime friend there. But th the point is, the question is, what is the oldest religion? Is it Santeria? Is it Hinduism? Is it uh, Kabbalah? Is it Judaism? Okay, this is what we are trying to get to. Okay, but last time on the show, we talked about the second person of the Holy Trinity. Of course, you know, he is a part of the Trinity. So we spoke about the second person of the Holy Trinity, Jesus Christ, true God, true man, right? And we spoke about the fact that the scriptures, they refer to Jesus Christ as the Word, right? The Word. And, of course, the Gospel of John, the very first chapter of the Gospel of John, opens in this way. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Okay. Uh, did you notice that? John, he applies the word he to word. Right? And so, right there, we have evidence that the word is a person. Right? The word is a person. It is Jesus Christ. Right? Because right now, I am communicating, you know, an array of words to you. Right? But I can't apply the word he to any of these words, right? How could I? And yet John here opens his gospel by applying the word he to the word word. Doesn't make sense, right? Unless the word that he refers to, which of course it is Jesus Christ who he is speaking of here, but the only way that it makes sense to apply the word he to the word word is if that word is a person, right? And so, in the beginning was the word, we are told by John, and the word was with God, and the word was God, right? And the only way that the word that G, uh, or that John refers to here can have the word he applied to it is if that word is a person, right? And we know that it is a person because it is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, in the beginning, and, you know, we really, we can't apply the word beginning to Jesus Christ, to God, because God is an eternal being, and so there is no beginning, there is no end, right? To God or to Jesus Christ, right? Uh, because Jesus Christ is God, and because God the Father is God, and so there is no beginning. You know, God says to Moses, I am who am. In other words, there is no beginning to me, I just am. You know, Jesus Christ, he says, before Abraham was, I am, right? There is no beginning to Jesus Christ. The only reason why 
John uses the word or the phrase in the beginning is because, you know, he has to use words that relate, that we can relate to, right? That relate to, uh, to the human person, right? And so we can relate to the word in the beginning. The way that we see life, right, is through the prism of a beginning and an end, right? And so God is alive, right? And so in our human minds, it's hard to grasp anything that is alive but has no beginning and has no end. But God, we know, has no beginning and has no end, right? Uh, we are told that by John himself when he says, he says he was in the beginning with God. And then in the following verse, he says, all things came to be through him, Right? And we see the same language in Colossians 1.17. He was before all things, and in him all things hold together. Right? He was before all things. Right? Things have limit. Right? They have time attached to them. There is a beginning and there is an end to things. But God is not a thing. He is pure spirit. Jesus Christ, he is pure spirit. Okay, and don't forget the goal here, okay? The aim of the, uh, of this conversation, what is the oldest religion on the face of the planet? That's where, where we are going, okay? But I need to set it up, right? But no beginning, no end to Jesus Christ. He is eternal. God operates in eternity, Right? This is why that sacrifice on Calvary applies to us today. The merits, the graces from that sacrifice can be applied to us today. We are saved by that sacrifice on Calvary in spite of the fact that we are 2,000 years removed from the actual event. Right? But because it was the sacrifice of an an eternal being, right? Then the merits of that sacrifice and the graces from that sacrifice can be applied to us because God, Jesus Christ, the eternal being, he operates in eternity. And so therefore, the merits and the graces from that sacrifice can be applied to, to you and I, 2,000 years removed, right? They can be applied to the Blessed Mother, to the Virgin Mary, the Mother of God. And this is why we say as Catholics that the Blessed Mother, she was born without the stain of original sin, and that she committed no personal sin, not because of anything that she herself merited, right? or anything that she did on her own, or apart from God, but it's because the graces from that sacrifice on Calvary were fully applied to the Blessed Mother in reverse, right? Because that sacrifice took place in eternity. And in, so in the same way that those merits and graces can be applied to us 2,000 years removed, right? It can be applied to her right uh a a a generation prior to the sacrifice actually taking place in time right and we see this in the mass you know the mass the sacrifice of the mass you know uh, uh we refer to uh the mass as as the unbloody sacrifice because it, because it is the same sacrifice that took place on calvary Right? The same sacrifice in an unbloody manner. Right? And during the Mass, the veil is torn open. Right? The Catholic Church is like a portal. You know? It is like a portal through which God operates here on this earth. You know, when a priest forgives sin, it is God who, through the priest, forgives that sin not the priest himself right and so the catholic church is like a portal and god operates here on this earth through that portal through the seven sacraments through the mass right and so the sacrifices at calvary 
they can be applied to us 2,000 years removed, and they can be applied to the Blessed Mother, you know, a generation or two prior to the sacrifice actually taking place in time, because it already took place in eternity, right? So, God works in eternity. He is not limited, right, by body parts, by time, right? He is boundless. He is not bound. He is boundless, right? So, uh, uh, God operates in eternity, right? Jesus Christ, you know, the Word, as we talked about last time on the show, a word begins as a thought. And of course, again, once again, there is no beginning to Jesus Christ. He was always with God, as we are told by John in the Gospel of John. He was with, with God, always with God, right? And the reason he was always with God is because a word is always with that person, the, the, the thought, right? The thought is always in, especially when, when, when you are talking about a supernatural being, an eternal being, right? That word was always with God. That thought, right? That thought was always with God. It comes out of the nature of God. And this is why we say that uh, Jesus Christ, he possesses the same nature as God because he came out of the nature of God, right? Uh, and so, God is Jesus Christ, right? Because he came out of the nature of God, right? And so, God operates in eternity. The Word was always with God, right? The idea of the Word was always with God, right? From the beginning, if we want to look at it that way, right? Makes it maybe a little bit easier for us to, to grasp, right? But He was always with God. The idea, the Word, was always with God, right? And we can apply to a certain extent, we can apply, we can apply the same idea to the Catholic Church, right? The same theology to the Catholic Church from all eternity, right? God knew that he would come to earth and establish the Catholic Church, right? And heck, I mean, we, we can even uh, look to the Encyclopedia Britannica, right? The Encyclopedia Britannica. If you look up the Catholic Church in the Encyclopedia Britannica, we are told that the Catholic Church was the church that was established by Jesus Christ in 33 A.D., right? In 33 A.D., Jesus Christ established the Catholic Church according to the Encyclopedia Britannica. Established it in time. But don't forget, he is an eternal being. And so the Catholic Church was always with God. And it was revealed to us bit by bit, increment by increment, right? And so the oldest religion is not Judaism, it's not Hinduism, it's not Kabbalah, it is the Catholic Church from all eternity. The Catholic Church here on this earth, fellow Catholics, okay? You know, Jesus Christ himself, he says, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And part of the fulfillment of that law is the Catholic Church, right? The kingdom of God has come upon you, says our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the Gospels, right? And what is that kingdom? It is the Catholic Church. It is that portal through which God operates on this earth. The Catholic Church, fellow Catholics, the oldest religion is not Kabbalah, it's not Judaism, it's not Hindu, it's definitely not Santeria, all right? It is the Catholic Church, fellow Catholics. Let's go ahead and take a break, and we will see you on the other side. Please, fellow Catholics, do not touch 
that mouse. It was the night of the Last Supper. Jesus knew the time had come for him to leave the world, yet he wanted to remain with us just as personally as if he had never left. How did he accomplish this? By instituting the priesthood. From generation to generation, he would handpick men to minister in his person. St. John Biani said, If we were to fully realize what a priest is on earth, we would die, not of fright, but of love. Is this really how we view our priests? Even though priests are human and imperfect, they bring us the sacraments, including the forgiveness of sins. It is through the office of the priesthood that Christ accomplishes his saving work. How can we not then pray for our priests, affirm them, and lift them up? St. Vianney said, What use would be a house filled with gold were there no one to open its door? The priest holds the key to the treasures of heaven. It is he who opens the door. Together, we build and run hospitals, schools, shelters. We feed the hungry. We comfort the afflicted. We serve all who come. We do this in ways large and small because we are called to do it. We live in a country that promises to protect the right to practice our faith every day, everywhere. That right does not start when we enter our churches. That right does not end when we leave our pews. We are Catholics. We are Americans. We will defend our right to practice our faith free from government coercion. Join us. Together, we will be heard. Well, that's you, my pretty, and your little dog, too. I think the greatest sin in the world is bringing children into the world. I love to sing your praise. What's going on, fellow Catholics? We are back. Cafeteria Catholics. And I am your humble host, Ephraim Cortez. And as I said, we are all over the internet, fellow Catholics. No excuse for you not to reach out to Cafeteria Catholics and help us, help us to take the teaching of the Catholic Church out into the streets as we have been directed to do by our Pope, Pope Francis. Okay, no excuse, no excuse, fellow Catholics. But anyway, you never know, do you? You never know when we are going to come to you, do you? You know that it's on the weekend. You know that it's on the weekend. You know you are waiting with bated breath on the weekend because you know it's Cafeteria Catholics time, right? <laughs> or at least I like to think so. Right? But you never know. Is it going to be on a Saturday? Is it going to be on a Sunday? When is it? When is it? Right? And I wish that I could come to you every day, fellow Catholics. But, you know, we I, I've got, you know, a family to support, right? And, unfortunately, this does not pay the bills, right? I wish that it did. I would love to do this for a living and come to you every day, but unfortunately, it has to wait till the weekend, fellow Catholics, but you just never know. Is it going to be on a Saturday? Is it going to be on a Sunday? Is it going to be maybe not at all? all? You know, if it's Mother's Day, if it's Father's Day. And by the way, okay, wh what's the deal with this trend? Here, let me take a drink of water, fellow Catholics, before I get into this, right? Because, uh, hey, <laughs> I'm about to get, you know, well, here, let me take a drink. What is the deal with this trend that I've been seeing on Facebook? You know, Father's Day, right? It's Father's Day, and here are these people wishing mothers a happy Father's Day. What's the deal with that? Do we not have enough confusion out there, right? Gender confusion out there. Right? Uh, 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 role confusion out there with homosexual marriage and homosexuality and so forth. we got to confuse the roles even more. Right? You've got your own day on Mother's Day. Enjoy Mother's Day. Be appreciative for it. Right? 
Father's Day is for fathers. As uh, Archbishop Salvatore Corte de Leone said uh, the other day on that clip that I played for you, only a man can be a father and only a woman can be a mother. You've got your own day. It's called Mother's Day. Right? You know, this is part of the problem. This is part of the problem. Uh, from the beginning, from the beginning, is part of the, this is part of the problem, is that women, <laughs> women, right, they can't, they can't just be satisfied with what it is that God has given them, right? Women just don't know their places, right? From the beginning, they just don't know their place. It's just the way that it is, right? Uh, Eve, look at Eve, right? Here we have Adam and Eve, right? They're together. Eve has her role. Adam has his role. And the minute that Eve stepped out of her role, and she decided that she was going to make decisions that pertained to the welfare of their union, right? Chaos ensued, right? And we are still paying the price because Eve did not know her place. And so she had to make decisions, decisions that were not for her to make, right? And not that I'm scapegoating, uh, you know, uh, Adam in any way because, hey, you know, he followed along. Instead of, you know, putting his foot down and saying, well, no, that's not the way that it's going to be because God said, you know, God said what he said and we are going to abide by that. And so he has to go along with uh, Eve's decision, but she steps out of her role, right? We've spoken about, we spoke about it last time on the show. There is an order, a certain order that has been put into place by God. Everything has an order. The sacraments, they have an order. Illegal immigration, immigration in this country, which we are going to get into, has an order, right? Every time we step out of order, chaos ensues, right? So please, stop the insanity, right? And I appreciate the fact there's mothers out there who are doing it all on their own, right? And it's hard. It's hard to do it. You know, I've been married for 20 years. And it's hard even when it's a, mo a, a, a mom and a dad. It's hard, right? So I couldn't imagine. I couldn't imagine how hard it is for, for single mothers, right? But we also have single fathers out there who on Father's Day, I don't go around saying Happy, mo uh, uh, Happy Mother's Day. You have your own day. It's called Father's Day, okay? So... Stay in your place. Okay, just stay in your place. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, you know. I mean, we all have a role to play. Only a man can be a father and only a woman can be a mother. You can't handle the truth. Just the way that it is, right? So go back to your corner. <laughs> Go back to your corner, and I'll go back to mine, okay? But anyway, so you, you never know. You never know when we are going to uh, come to you, right? But you know that it's on the weekend, right? And maybe some of you have, you know, <laughs> clicked away by now. But, hey, right, it's on a Saturday or a Sunday we come to you. And I had every intention... The entire week I had every intention of coming to you on Saturday, right? But what happened on Friday? On Friday, I come across this report, this article on Drudge Report, that Nancy Pelosi, the Wicked Witch of the Senate... I'll get you, my pretty, and your little dog, too! <laughs> <laughs> Nancy Pelosi, that jackal over there, right... She decides that she is going to make a trip over to the southern border where we've got all of these illegal immigrants violating our immigration laws and just, 
you know, crossing the border into our country, right? And then the other day, we had this uh, Mexican military helicopter fire on border agents. You see that, fellow Catholics? Fire on border agents, right? We just, we have no respect anymore. No one respects the United States anymore because of this uh, silly person we have over there as president in the White House, right? No one respects us anymore. We've got the Mexican military firing on border agents, fellow Catholics, okay? But anyway, so it's, it's a mess down there. It's a mess down there at the border, right? And Nancy Pelosi, she decides she's going to go over to the border on Saturday. And so I said, okay, well, let, let me wait. Let me wait, right? Because I want to get my hands, because you know she's going to make a statement, right? You know she's going to make a statement at the border, right? There's no way that she is going to uh, miss out on the symbolism of making a statement at the southern border where, where you've got all of these uh, people, you know, you, you know, a lot of them are kids, right? Underage kids crossing into our country illegally, right? So there's no way that she's going to miss out on the symbolism of making a statement at the border, right? So I decided I'm going to wait right and i knew i knew i knew that she would make a statement and you know i've got a clip from that statement and uh i played it at the top of the show and we're going to play it again but i decided to wait i decided to wait and this is why today is sunday and we are doing the show on sunday because i waited all day yesterday for this the statement that i knew that she would make okay but anyway Let's go ahead and play that clip once again, fellow Catholics, okay? Nancy Pelosi at the southern border, okay? If you believe, as we do, that every child, every person has a spark of divinity in them and is therefore worthy of respect. Okay, if a person, every person, every child has a spark of divinity, right? Then why do you support abortion? You are doing away with the divine. And she's right. In a certain sense, she is right, right? The fingerprint of God is on every human person. Because as we've spoken about before, God provides the eternal soul for every human being, right? And so the fingerprint of God is in all of us. There is a spark of divinity in all of us, as she says. So why is she for abortion? Why is she for abortion, fellow Catholics? That's what I want to know. What we saw in those rooms was dazzling, sparkling, array of God's children worthy of respect. So we have to use, as was said this morning, the, the crisis that some view as a crisis, and it does have crisis uh, at, uh, qualities, as an opportunity to show who we are as Americans, that we do respect people for their dignity and worth. So it's dazzling, right? It's dazzling. Are you a pothead, Farker? <laughs> Tell me about it. You know, are you high over there, Nancy? But, uh... <laughs> so, it's dazzling, right? And we have to uh, uh, respect the dignity and the worth of every human person, she says, right? All the while, she's supporting abortion. She was in support, full support, of partial birth abortion back a few years ago, Right? But yet, at the same time, she recognizes that every human person is worthy of respect, right? And that they have dignity and worth. And yet, she has no qualms with aborting persons in the womb, left and right, right? Has no qualms with it, right? And as a matter of fact... Uh, when she was asked about abortion or about the Kermit Gosnell situation, right, by a reporter back 
last year, was it last year or a couple of years ago? Oh, time flies by. But Kermit Gosnell, we all remember Kermit, right? This, this, this guy killing babies outside of the womb, right? Crushing their spines, you know? And uh, when she was asked about that, this is what she had to say. This is not the issue. They are saying that there's no uh, abortion. They want to make it a federal law that there be no abortion in our country. You're taking the extreme case. You're taking the extreme case. And what I'm saying to you is what happened in Philadelphia was reprehensible. And I do not think you use that. I'm not going to have this conversation with you because you obviously have an agenda. You're not interested in having an answer. But I have responded to you to the extent that I'm going to respond to you because I want to tell you something. As a mother of five children, my oldest child is six years old the day I brought my fifth child home. So abortion is sacred ground, right? Never mind the dignity and the worth of the human person. That's not sacred. Abortion, the means by which we do away with the human person, this is sacred ground. Are you, do you believe that, fellow Catholics? Are you a pothead, Farker? I mean, she, she, she's got to be. <laughs> She's got to be high. She's got to be high. She makes no sense, fellow Catholics. Okay? There she is, you know, uh, uh, upholding the, the dignity and the worth of the human person as the American ideal. And yet at the same time, she considers abortion to be sacred ground, fellow Catholics. And not the dignity of the human person. You know, the dignity of the human person, uh, the worth of the human person, that takes a back seat to abortion. Right? As a practicing and respectful Catholic, this is sacred ground to me. It's sacred ground to her, fellow Catholics. You believe this? Do you believe that, fellow Catholics? You see, this is the thing about politicians, right? Double speak, spin. This is what they are all about. Who knows how she really feels about abortion? You know, this is the thing that scares me about Nancy Pelosi. I'm scared for her, right? Because it, you remember back a couple of years ago, Ted Kennedy, he passed away, and he was just as ardent about abortion as Nancy Pelosi. And on his deathbed, I guess reality creeped in, and he wrote a letter to Benedict the Sixteenth, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, asking that he would pray for his soul, right? Because I think that the cold, hard truth actually hit Ted Kennedy when he was on his deathbed and he realized that he was on the wrong side of, uh, of, 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 of the issue of abortion, right? And not just abortion, but other issues, right? And other, you know, you know there are all kinds of st stories about Ted Kennedy, right? No need to, you know, kick the guy while he's in the grave, right? But, you know, all kinds of stories about Ted Kennedy, you know. And, uh, but it seems like the guy actually repented at the end, right? But Nancy Pelosi, she comes across as the type of person that is so proud and arrogant that even on her deathbed, she will not repent. I think that she will go to her death standing up for abortion, right? And advancing the idea that abortion, there's nothing wrong with, right? There's nothing wrong with abortion, right? And so I am scared for this woman. So keep Nancy Pelosi in your prayers, fellow Catholics, because this woman, she is hard-nosed, hard-headed when it comes to abortion. And on top of that, 
and advances herself as an ardent Catholic, as a loyal Catholic, as a uh, practicing, respectful Catholic, right? But I waited, I waited to come to you till today because I knew that she was going to make a statement, right? And meanwhile, I mean, it's chaos down there. It's not just little kids, you know, underage kids who are coming across the border. No, there's reports out there. We, we've got MS-13 gang members coming into this country, right? So it's not just kids, right? And this is the problem. This is the problem when you have no borders. You have no idea who's coming into your country to do what. Right? Not everybody is here to work. Not everyone is here to work. You know, and the Catholic bishops, they're all for it. They're all for it. All for illegal immigration, fellow Catholics. You know, encouraging. There is a subliminal message that is being sent to these people because they truly believe that you know, if they cross the border and they make it to America, they can stay. They can stay. Somehow, I don't know how, but somehow, someone is uh, informing these people that they can cross into the United States and they get to stay. Right? I mean, is it someone actually informing these people that, uh, that this is uh, the way that it is here in this country now? Or is it a subliminal message being sent by uh, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, by politicians such as Nancy Pelosi, right? Because here they are, publicly advocating for illegal immigration. They are advancing their cause here in this country. The United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, the Pope Bomb Administration, some Republicans... Right? And so there is a message being sent, a subliminal message being sent, that you are welcomed. Legally or illegally, you are welcomed into this country. Anyway, I found this clip on YouTube, and it's from 2009. And this priest's name... Let's see. Is uh, I wrote it down. His name is Father Thomas Reese. He is senior fellow, or he was at the time in 2009. He was senior fellow at the Woodstock Theological Center at Georgetown University. All right. And uh, let's see. Do I have the right clip here? Let's hope this is it. But, uh, this is what he had to say about the bishop's support. I hope I have the right clip here, fellow Catholics. This is what he had to say about the bishop's support of, uh, illegal immigration. Well, first of all, the Catholic bishops are not encouraging yeah, people to break the law. What the Catholic bishops support is a process for legalization of people who are already in the United States who have been contributing to their... Okay, so stop it right there. Okay? He says that the Catholic bishops are not encouraging the breaking of the law. Right? What they want is a legalization of people who are already here. Right? The thing is, if they are not here illegally then why must we find a process by which they are made legal, right? There shouldn't be a need for such a process if they were already here legally. But the fact of the matter is, is that they are here illegally. And by the actions of our bishops trying to uh, finagle some kind of way by which these lawbreakers can stay here, you are indeed advancing the violation, the breaking of our laws. Immigration laws. 
you are advancing that idea. And he can say whatever he wants, that he's not, that the Catholic bishops are not doing this. But the fact of the matter is, this is precisely what they are doing. Communities who have been paying taxes, who have children who have been born in the United States, uh, that they have a path towards legalization. There shouldn't be a path to legalization if they were not here illegally to begin with. And so, by their actions, they are, they are encouraging the breaking of our laws here in this country, fellow Catholics, okay? What about breaking? Here, let's go ahead and take another break, fellow Catholics. I've, I've been talking for too long. Let's go ahead and take another break. And we will see you on the other side once again, fellow Catholics. Before you can blink, we will be right back. Okay, I'm going to mention a word that might make you a little uncomfortable. Suffering. Now, we all know what it feels like. But how are we going to handle suffering when it comes our way? We can run away from our trials and try to escape them. But here's another option. If we choose to lovingly accept the pain that we have no control over, we can turn ordinary suffering into redemptive suffering. Think of it as suffering with a purpose. Now this isn't easy, but it's when times are tough that we can show God just how much we love Him. We can choose to offer up our pain for others and even for ourselves, that we may become better people, more ready for heaven. By embracing our suffering, we can turn our pain into something beautiful and find a joy that would have never been possible if the suffering had not come along in the first place. Now our world does not understand the concept of redemptive suffering, but that's okay. We can look to the example of someone who does. It was the night of the Last Supper. Jesus knew the time had come for him to leave the world. Yet he wanted to remain with us just as personally as if he had never left. How did he accomplish this? By instituting the priesthood. From generation to generation, he would handpick men to minister in his person. St. John Biani said, If we were to fully realize what a priest is on earth, we would die. Not of fright, but of love. Is this really how we view our priests? Even though priests are human and imperfect, they bring us the sacraments, including the forgiveness of sins. It is through the office of the priesthood that Christ accomplishes his saving work. How can we not then pray for our priests, affirm them, and lift them up? St. Vianney said, What use would be a house filled with gold were there no one to open its door? The priest holds the key to the treasures of heaven. It is he who opens the door. I'd like to be in an orphan It's my greatest! I thought that I might make it on my own You can't handle the truth! Until I found myself a morning You a planet, Parker? Penniless with no place to call home What's going on, fellow Catholics? We are back. Cafeteria Catholics. Drop us a line, fellow Catholics. Cafeteria Catholics, Yahoo.com is the email. Let us know whether you like the show, whether you hate the show, whether you love the show, and you are listening to Cafeteria Catholics. And I am your humble host, Efren Cortez. Great to be here. Great to be uh, spending an afternoon, a Sunday afternoon, with you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, but, so, the United States Conf- uh, Conference of Catholic Bishops no qualms with violating or uh, advancing the idea that it's okay. It's okay to break immigration law in this country, right? Well, what adv- what about advancing the idea that it's okay to break immigration law into the Catholic Church? You know, there is immigration law within the Catholic Church. Right, you can't just uh, walk in the back door, or climb in an open window and get in line and receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you are not a Catholic, and in some cases, even if you are Catholic, right? 
But if you are not a Catholic, there is a process by which you become Catholic. Just like we have a process in this country by which you become American. Right? And that process does not involve climbing the fence. Does not involve crossing our borders illegally. We have a process, an orderly process in this country. I mean, look at what's happening right now, right? We've got measles, an outbreak at the southern border. Measles and all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, diseases. As a matter of fact, here, let's go ahead and play this clip from Nancy Pelosi at the border. Okay? Perhaps the most tragic image I will take home with me, and I wish I could take him too, was the little boy who was infected with the virus and then in isolation, all by himself. But that's for his safety and for the safety of others. And so you see, she admits, we have immigration laws in place for the safety of Americans. You know, she says this kid is infected with this virus, and don't know, I don't remember her uh, 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 specifying what a virus, you know. But the point being is that we have immigration laws that we need to know who's coming into this country. Are they sick? Are they drug dealers? Are they here to traffic drugs? Are they here to traffic human beings? You know, and during this statement that she made, she talks about the need to do away with trafficking, human trafficking. Well, one of the ways in which you do that is that you have laws, immigration laws in place to find out whether the people who are coming into this country are here to traffic human beings, right? And so this woman, I mean, she makes no sense whatsoever. Are you a pothead, Farker? <laughs> she contradicts herself all over the place, right? But we have to have an orderly process by which people come into this country. Just like we have an orderly process by which people come into the Catholic Church. Right? You have to believe the same things that we do. You have to believe that baptism is regenerative. Right? Not some symbolic ritual. Right? You have to believe that the Eucharist is the actual body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, not a cracker or a wafer. You have to believe that. And we have to ensure that you believe that prior to you coming into the Catholic Church. We have to ensure that you are baptized, that you have received confirmation. You know, there's an array of uh, issues that have to be uh, taken care of before you come into the Catholic Church, before you come into the community of the Catholic Church, right? And in the same way, we have a process. There are all kinds of issues that have to be taken care of before you become a member of the community of, uh, uh, of America. And our Catholic bishops... You know, thank God, they are not going to just sweep away that process that has to be undergone before someone becomes Catholic, right? They will not do that. Even the most liberal of bishops, even the most liberal of priests will honor that process, right? It will mean so much more to become Catholic, to be Catholic, after you go through that process, after you come to understand why it is that the Catholic Church teaches what it teaches on so many issues, right? Why certain things are sin, right? Why certain things are venial sins, why certain things are mortal sins, right? Uh, you will appreciate your becoming Catholic so much more, right, than if you just simply climbed over a fence, or came in the back door, or climbed through a open window, right, and received uh, what you believe to be a wafer, right? 
It is not a wafer, it is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we need to know and we need to ensure that you fully understand that. Because we have Catholics today who don't. Right? We have Catholics today who believe that the oldest religion is Santeria. Right? So we need to ensure before you become a Catholic that you understand the teaching of the Catholic Church on a whole array of aspects, right? You can't just climb in, you know, through a hole in the fence. Can't just uh, come in the back door. We need to ensure that your intention of becoming Catholic is sincere, right? And in the same way, we need to ensure that your intention of becoming an, uh, an American is sincere, that you are not here to do us harm in some way, blow up a building or a monument or something, right? Or that you are not here to uh, sell drugs or traffic drugs or human beings or to rape our women or to mow over our citizens on American streets. We need to know this before you become an American citizen. But there's Nancy Pelosi, right? And she had a bishop down there. I forget the name of the bishop, but there is a bishop present, right? So there is a subliminal message being sent to these people that if they come over the border, they can stay. They can stay. And we've got Mexican, Mexican military firing on border agents. It is a mess down there, fellow Catholics. It is a, it's a mess at the border. It is a mess at the border under this administration, right? The country is a mess under this administration. You know, I talked to my sister-in-law this, this, this morning on the way back from church. And, uh, you know, she was talking about how this president, he is not a patriot. He is not, right? He is not. He does not have, you know, the best interests of America or of Americans at heart. He doesn't. doesn't like this country. He does not like this country, fellow Catholics. Okay? We have found the enemy, and it is Barack Hussein Obama. <laughs> it is Barack Hussein Obama. You can't handle the truth! And it is what it is, fellow Catholics. It is what it is. Okay? That is the enemy, fellow Catholics. But we have, we have an orderly process by which people who desire to become Catholic become Catholic. Right? An orderly process, because we need to maintain order within the walls of Holy Mother Church. Right? And I know, as I've said before, you walk into some parishes and there is no order. There's nothing but chaos, right? People holding hands during the Our Father. Uh, 34 Eucharistic ministers up there spilling the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on the floor. Dropping uh, uh, the body of our Lord on the floor. You know, it's chaos, you know. Some people are, you know, making certain gestures that other people in the pews are not, right? And the priest up there says nothing about it, right? And so people are left to their own devices, right? Just do whatever you want at Mass, right? There is no order in the liturgy, no order whatsoever, right? There is no order in what it is that we believe as Catholics because the clergy, they've dropped the ball. So Catholics, they have no idea what to believe, and so they make it up as they, as they go. You know, beach ball Catholicism. This is what's going on in the pews. Beach ball Catholicism. Yeah, just do whatever you like. You know. They don't know what to believe anymore. You know, is purgatory is is that still a doctrine of the church? Who knows? Who cares? Right? The priest doesn't talk about it, so it must not be that important. Right? Our bishops they don't talk about it, so it must not be that important. Right? The rosary. Do we need to pray? Who cares about the rosary? The Vatican II did away with the rosary. Right? How many times have you heard heard that? You know, that little nugget there. 
You know, Vatican II did away with uh, uh, the rosary. It did away with confession. You don't need to go to confession, right? There's no such thing as sin. We believe, not as Catholics, we believe as the Protestants do, right? Jesus Christ died for our sins, and so therefore we are saved. Our sins have been covered by the blood of Christ. We don't need to go to confession, right? This is all old folklore of the Catholic Church, right? And nothing could be further from the truth. If you believe that, get yourself a catechism of the Catholic Church, all right? Do yourself a favor. Get yourself a catechism of the Catholic Church and, you know, find out for yourself what it is that the Catholic Church teaches, right? And while you're at it, maybe you can find for me where it is in the Catechism of the Catholic Church that it says, where is it that the Catholic, uh, Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches that illegal immigration is a moral imperative? I, I want to know, all right? I can't find it anywhere. Where is it? Where does it say that illegal immigration into this country is a moral imperative? You know what I think? I think the bishops are lying to us, right? They're complicating uh, the matter even more, right? Catholics are confused, don't know what to believe, right? And they are taking advantage of that. Rather than fixing the problem, they take advantage of it in order to advance their own uh, political agenda. Because this is what it is. It is a political agenda. It has nothing to do with the teaching of the Catholic Church, right? But they know, they know, because they themselves have not catechized lay people from the pulpit in so many decades, they know that Catholics have no clue what it is that the Catholic Church teaches. So they can go up there and say, oh, it's a moral imperative for, uh, for you to support illegal immigrants into this country, right? And the majority of Catholics will probably believe it, right? Because they have no clue. They have no clue. You know? Like Cardinal Timothy Dolan has said, in 37 years, rare has been the time that he has talked about, preached about, contraception, homosexuality, and abortion. Right? Rare are the times. Right? So if he's not talking about those issues... He's not talking about homosexuality, not talking about uh, 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 abortion and contraception. Then, chances are, he's probably not talking about purgatory, right? He's not talking about hell. Not talking about any of that stuff, right? And so, he, along with his uh, fellow clergy, many of them, not all of them, right? Just went to Mass this morning, a uh, legionary priest... Uh, Father Seepley, Great Homily, right? And the Legionnaires of Christ, yeah, th these guys, they are down the line Catholic, right? Anytime you get the chance to hear a homily or hear a talk from a Legionnaire priest, you better take advantage of it because you are going to get the teaching of the Catholic Church, right? Not unlike, you know, some within the clergy, right? Who have dumbed down the laity, by not speaking about the teaching of the Catholic Church, right? And so now they can get away with telling you that illegal immigration is a moral imperative, right? They won't say illegal, right? They will omit that word, and they'll say immigration is a moral imp imperative. But what they really mean, whenever you hear a bishop speaking about immigration... What they are really speaking about is illegal immigration. This is what they are speaking about. Okay? They are lying to you. Okay? Men of God lying to you. This is what they are doing. Okay? Do not be fooled by the collar. Okay? Do not be fooled by the collar because they don't take the collar seriously themselves. Okay? So do not be fooled by it. Okay? They are lying to you. Illegal immigration is not a moral imperative. Okay? But anyway, let's go ahead and leave it there, fellow Catholics. 
And we will see you next time on Cafeteria Catholics. Please pray for our bishops. Please pray for the Catholic Church. Please pray for our political leaders. And just please pray in general, fellow Catholics. Our country, as you know, is in dire need of prayer. So please pray. See you next time, fellow Catholics. God bless. Sing